Shalom and welcome to the Theoria channel, where we look at the ancient manuscripts of the Bible and then ask the question, what was it that the authors of this ancient literature were trying to communicate to their readers? In this video, I'd like to take a look at a couple of verses from the book of Deuteronomy chapter 4. The oldest copies of this passage that exist today come from the Dead Sea Scrolls, but they are extremely fragmentary and a lot of the pieces have even less than one word on them. So we're going to translate this passage from the Damascus Codex. It is a Masoretic text, so it is in the same manuscript family as the Leningrad and Aleppo codices, although this manuscript only contains the Torah. So it doesn't tend to get as much attention as its more complete cousins, but it is an important manuscript nonetheless. And it's also worth noting here that among these couple of verses, there is no textual variation to speak of between the available manuscripts. And before we dive into translating this passage and trying to work out what the author of this literature was trying to say, let's begin with some context. From what we know about the book of Deuteronomy, it was likely written during the time between the destruction of the northern kingdom of Israel by the Assyrian Empire and the destruction of the kingdom of Judah by the Babylonian Empire. The specific historical situation that best fits the content of the book is the religious reforms of King Josiah. His story is that when he became king of Judah, he reinstated the worship of Yahweh, and the book of the law was found or rediscovered. And from that literature, he learned that the reason for the destruction of Israel was that they had broken the covenant that they had with Yahweh, and they worshiped the gods of other nations. And furthermore, Due to that the nation of Judah had been worshipping other gods and breaking the covenant, the inevitable consequence of this would be their subjugation by a foreign nation in the near future. The book of Deuteronomy addresses this situation by incorporating the text of the covenant into a kind of theological commentary. The original material, which is also found in the book of Exodus, was edited and stylized into the book of Deuteronomy and it was meant as a way of explaining the theological reasons for the destruction of Israel and the imminent fall of the nation of Judah. The dialogue in Deuteronomy is nested in three layers. There's the narrator, Moses, and Yahweh. And periodically throughout the text, the narrator will borrow the voice of Moses to directly relate what is being said to the current situation. And this is what's going on here in chapter 4. It is the voice of Moses introducing the stipulations of the covenant. In verses 15 through 31, he is specifically addressing the issue of idolatry. That is, the worship of beings and things other than Yahweh. In the cosmic meta-narrative of the ancient people of Israel and Judah, at the Tower of Babel event, God distanced himself from dealing with humanity. He did this by dividing the nations up by languages and allotted them to celestial beings to be their so-called gods, but he took the descendants of Abraham as his own nation, and thus they were forbidden from worshiping the gods of other nations. And when they did, the natural repercussions of this would be the curse of the Tower of Babel, which they had been spared by being Yahweh's nation, would fall upon them, and they would become part of those other nations. And this is exactly what is described in Deuteronomy chapter 4. So this is the voice of Moses addressing the ancient Israelites when they were about to cross the Jordan River and enter into the Promised Land. And the author of the book of Deuteronomy is using this speech by Moses in the distant past to explain to the reader their current situation. So the best way to read the book of Deuteronomy is to imagine yourself living in the city of Jerusalem during the 6th century BC. The nation of Israel to the north is gone, and you're in the nation of Judah, having been worshiping gods other than Yahweh. Now here comes King Josiah, who reinstates the worship of Yahweh, and you're handed the book of Deuteronomy to read, so you're reading the words of Moses addressing your distant ancestors just before they entered the land, and here you are living in the promised land on the verge of being kicked out of it because you've been doing the very thing that Moses had warned your ancestors not to do. And this is the voice of Moses. When you look up into the sky and see the sun, moon, and stars, and all the hosts of heaven, do not be seduced into worshiping them, for Yahweh your God allotted them to all the peoples of the earth. Remember that Yahweh rescued you from the iron furnace of Egypt in order to make you his very own people, his own inheritance, which is what you are today. 
So be careful not to break the covenant Yahweh your God has made with you. Do not make idols of any shape or form, for Yahweh your God has forbidden this. Yahweh your God is a devouring fire. He is a jealous God. In the future, when you have children and grandchildren and have lived in the land a long time, do not corrupt yourselves by making idols of any kind. This is evil in the sight of Yahweh your God and will arouse his anger. Today I call upon heaven and earth as witnesses against you. If you break my covenant, you will quickly disappear from the land you are crossing the Jordan to occupy. You will live there only a short time. Then you will be utterly destroyed. For Yahweh will scatter you among the nations, where only a few of you will survive. But from there you will search again for Yahweh your God. And if you search for him with all your heart and soul, you will find him. Now returning to our manuscript, the first clause, Batsar lecha um sauka kol hadarim ha'ela ve'chacharit hayamim. And since this clause is a dependent clause, it's appropriate to translate this initial preposition that's prefixed on this first word as the English word when. And the word itself is an adjective meaning narrow. So this is narrow to you. And this is just a way of talking about distress or tribulation. It's kind of like in English when you say being in a bad way or in a tough spot. And translating the rest of this clause extremely literally, it would be, and found of you all the things, the these, in the later, the days. So translated literally in English, it would be a bit awkward, but you can see the basic idea is that in the future when all these horrible things happen to you, but the things being referred to here are a very specific historical situation. And these are the things mentioned in the verses above. So we're talking about cities in ruins, piles of burning bodies, and a few survivors being dragged off in chains. So we're not talking about just having a bad day here. Now in this next clause, Moses tells them exactly what they should do about it when they find themselves in this situation. Wishavta ad Yahweh wishamata bekolo and return unto Yahweh, your God, and obey his voice. This first verb here is from the root shuv, which simply means to change direction or have a change of mind. And the idea behind it is that there's a fork in the road and you went down one way, but you discover that's the wrong direction. So you turn around, come back to the fork in the road and go down the other way. Older English translations used to just render this word repent. Although in modern English, that word is often used in a very specific context, so it's lost a lot of its more general meaning of just turning around or changing direction. So it would be appropriate to just render this as return. This second verb here comes from the root shema, which means to listen or to hear or to heed. But given the context here, it's appropriate to translate this as obey, with the simple idea behind it of following directions. Now we come to the second verse, and it begins with ki el rachum, which is because God of compassion or he is a God of compassion. And what follows is an explanation of exactly what that means. And we have Yahweh el Echecha, so Yahweh your God. And then we have a list of three things, each beginning with the Hebrew word lo, which is a way of indicating a negative. So the first one, lo yer pika. And this verb here is in what's called the Hifield stem, which just indicates a causative action between two people. And what it means is to let go or release or slip away. So this is, he will not let you go. And then the next one, will lo yershiteka. And again, this verb is also in the Hifield stem. So this is, he will not leave you to rot or decay. He will not abandon you to the forces of entropy. And then the third thing, will lo yishka, which is, he will not forget. And then there's this little Hebrew word here, et, which has no English equivalent whatsoever, but what it does is it indicates what follows is the direct object of the previous verb. So what follows is what he won't forget, and that is, Berit avoteka, hasher nispe lehem, the covenant of your fathers, or ancestors, which he swore to them. So to paraphrase these couple of verses, in the future, when all these horrible things happen to you, return to Yahweh and obey his voice. Because he is a God of compassion, Yahweh your God will not let you go. He will not leave you to rot, and he will not forget the covenant he made with your ancestors.
If you happen to have been living in Judah in 586 B.C., and you witness the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple by the Babylonian army, it would be perfectly natural for you to assume that Yahweh had been defeated in battle and you were now a Babylonian citizen, and it would be appropriate for you to worship Marduk or any of the other plethora of Babylonian deities. But the message of the book of Deuteronomy is no. The nation of Judah is no more because God's people had betrayed him and worshipped other gods. So the appropriate response for you as a survivor of this horrific tragedy is to stop worshiping other gods and return to Yahweh. And what these two verses tell us is that there is an opportunity for reconciliation between God and his people. Even though they betrayed him, he is still willing to keep his end of the covenant should they decide to return to him. Now, since neither you or I are living in that ancient world, these couple of verses do not apply to us directly. But this story does serve as an illustration of what God's grace really is. That is, even in spite of the people of Judah betraying him, he was still willing to maintain the covenant with them. He was still willing to reconcile. Now, the New Testament portrays Christ as establishing a new covenant. So in him, this betrayal is undone. And he also established a new kingdom. So the betrayal of the Tower of Babel is also undone. And he endured the consequence of all human sin and betrayal. So the result of humanity's expulsion from the Garden of Eden is also undone. So in Christ, not only did God keep his end of the covenant, but he became human and kept your end as well. So if you are a Christian, you are part of this new covenant, new kingdom, and a new humanity. And this ancient text in Deuteronomy chapter 4 can serve as a reminder to us that God does indeed afford us grace. So in spite of our failings and shortcomings, he has reconciled himself with humanity. And you and I get to be his people, regardless of the fact that we fall short. So at this point in the video, I usually present you with a question for your contemplation, such that in trying to answer it, it will suggest an application for the point of the text that we're looking at. I don't think that that's necessary here, since the point is so straightforward here. So I think I'll just read it again. And let it just be a reminder to Christians of the kind of grace that has been afforded you. Return unto Yahweh your God and obey his voice. Ki el rahum, because he is a God of compassion. Yahweh elehecha lo yar pecha. Yahweh your God will not let you slip away. Will lo yeshitecha. He will not leave you to rot. Et berit, and he will not forget the covenant 